Hey guys, welcome back to Channel Madness with your host Shin, and we're back here with part two of Heroes of the Siege, where I go over the last eight books um, found in this uh, Horus Heresy collection. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. Nine is the last son of Prospero, and we come back. We follow the um, Rubio Arvies, um who was the thousand son picked up on, I believe, Prospero um, by the White Scars after the White Scars decided to go check out to find out what happened there. Uh, this basically picks up from when they got back to Terra as he came under the the, um, the, the, the flesh change. It was taken to Malkador to try and be fixed, but unfortunately, Malkador being Malkador decided to try and use him to, um, to find the, the shard of Magnus that was on Terra to sort of find, create a guardian to, um, for the webway so that the Emperor could be freed. Um, obviously Khan, uh, the, the Khan, not, Jagatai Khan not being happy about this because he made a, he a blood debt to um, RV for saving saving him and his legion back way bit back before, so he's not he's not entirely happy about this. So as the, as the, as the, as the, as the shard and um, uh, RV sort of merge, but it's too much power. Um, Makuro goes to kill him, but Jag Jagatai intervenes and destroys the machinery, holding him down. And obviously, this new amalgamation of the two form not a not entirely a legionary, not entirely a primarch, sort of a an in between. Um, yeah, well, sort of an in between, not like Primaris or, or Custodes, but sort of in between between the Sun and in between with. Um, uh, Magnus. Um, yeah, I didn't know this until I looked it up, but it ends up that he becomes, uh, uh, he renamed himself to Ivanus, but I had a look at it, he ends up um, being Janus, the first Grand Master of the Great Knights, which I had assumed, which I thought was nice, because it does it does mean, like, oh, cool, it, it makes sense if, you know, that um, sort of the Shard of Magnus gets to play his part, which is really nice to, um, to have a case. It's an interesting story, I had to read it twice, because I didn't understand it the first time, which is kind of odd, because it was a little bit out there, but on the, upon the second time, it made a lot more sense, I did enjoy it, and I did think it, it's a nice sort of swing to see how the Grey Knights have formed, obviously, after the heresy and whatnot, and yeah, so that was part nine, or book nine in the Heralds of the Siege. Book ten in the Heralds of the Siege is the Soul Severed. And this, we come back to our beloved Empress children. I wouldn't say beloved, but yeah. Um, more specifically, <coughs> Lord Commander Eidolon, as he faces the challenge of leading the um, Empress children in Filgrim's absence. Obviously, from we know that Filgrim has become a demon prince, and he sort of is just doing his own thing elsewhere. Um, so, um, Eidolon has pretty much taken charge, or is trying to. Um, he, come, he runs across some competition in the form of an ambitious uh, Akorion. Akorion, name doesn't really matter. He doesn't last that long, obviously. Um, yeah. So basically, all that happens is 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 they sort of have a play for leadership who rules um, a, a setup. As, uh, you know, a well, not really a betrayal, but more of a, just a, a setup, and then ambush is sprung, and both sides fight each other, whatnot. Ireland's forces are trapped between giant vast containers of acid I, I think and then um, the other guy detonates them showering all, all um, Eidolon and his cacophony against an acid uh, hoping to kill them only because the only to find out that because they're sort of messed up and you know obviously because anyone who's read Filgrim knows that the change in the Empress Children is a big sort of difference um, it doesn't really kill them or causing pain it's sort of it, it's kind of like intense pain which to them is obviously intense you know feeling which is nice um and whatnot and obviously he lost his chance and uh um Eidolon and, and the cacophagine launch a giant air, um sound assault and basically slaughter him and all his men um this is not a, not all that important i think this is the, the important one in this one sort of like the um typhus story when we get to that if we haven't already um uh, is that um, this sort of really cements their developed um, feeling for obviously the intense sort of the in 
the, the intensity they have. They need to have that intense sort of emotion because nothing else, nothing else comes close anymore. Um, it also alters this sort of the, um, the appearance a little bit because obviously it's just acid amounts and more importantly it it, it cements the the sort of the pink color the 40k the synonymous 40k pink rather than their heresy you know livid purple that it was you know the acids messed with the armor and it sort of divulged it into a bright fluorescent pink so it's sort of so all the, these books are sort of setting pushing all the the heresy stuff into the 40k stuff as we know um, and then after after sort of the acid goes through, you know, he realizes he needs to go to Terra. This is this is the final. This is the final. Everyone else is sort of already on their way, and so Eilon's like, "All right, it's time for the Empress children to be a part of this as well and bring all this pleasure and pain to Terra." So yeah, that's all that really happens in this book. It's not too long, but um, it is nice. It's not, nice because it sort of cements the Empress children's you know origin colors, well the original you know, the colors that we we know them for, and why they're on their way to um. Um, Terra. Even though in the in the last one, last um, actual novel, Pilgrim sent out a call to summon all his his children, but I guess you know some of them weren't able to hear it. Um, yeah. So this just cements uh, cements how why you know Eidolon and his forces are along on the way to Terra. So yeah, that's the book ten. Let's move on. Dark Compliance is the eleventh book we come across in the audio collection, um, and this one's a little bit um, odd. It starts off with um, one of Horace's uh, heralds sent to a planet, um, which basically brings them into compliance or into Horace's side. Um, the character that's sent is it's the lunar it's the lunar wolf that was um, I think with um, Perturabo um, during the, some of the previous novels. Uh, I forgot his name. He has somewhat of importance, but not that much of importance. Um, sorry for that. Um, yeah, so he's sent to this planet to basically offer them. They like, tell them, you know, um, are you going to be are you going to be compliant to Horace's wishes? Um, and, start, and obviously they're like, no, we're loyal, so it's not going to like that. And he's like, um, well, let me tell you a story. And he basically he he, he recalls his, his account of um, of what Horace decided to do by showing him the last I think planet that decide to um not accept his hails and actually kill the herald that was sent so um that was like um akiza beta um who was uh, basically uh, the in charge of a heavy heavily fortified mechanicum um, um world and <coughs> after he killed the herald they basically prepared for war and horace basically just shows that um the current the new hero his strategy which is it, it's nice it's you know, it's basically just outmaneuvering. It's nothing we haven't seen anything before, but maybe the Void Missiles, I think, were sort of a new sort of toy um, ploy. He basically launched, like, 13 Void Missiles into, like, the defensive battery ring around the planet, opening up a huge wedge. Um, and then went, and then we, as he, and, you know, as the um, Lunar Wars began their assault on the planet, um, Horus went down, um, Akiza beat her, expecting, you know, a one-on-one -on -one fight, because that's how Horus is. Only to be let down. Horus, Horus went down basically to the middle of nowhere. Um, basically summoned the demon. He's like, this planet is yours. And then gave the order to retreat for Lunar Wars and basically just left it. Um, yeah. And, that, and, and then that's, that's basically... It goes into more depth, which is nice. But, um, but it just sort of change, shows you the change in Horus's mindset. He's, he's no longer, you know, he doesn't care if he just, you know, sacrifices a whole world for the, for, for you know, for a demon to feast. Akiza beat her is on the assumption that, you know, um, Horus is on his way to get him. He thinks, you know, they've deployed some sort of, um, uh, they have wheeled, uh, weather changing technology as obviously the sky starts to change and it starts raining dark viscous um uh liquid which obviously ends up being blood which we know and then the, the all the all these demons attack as the lunar rules are fleeing uh, well not fleeing but re not re retreating but you know they just came down to start the initial fight and they left as as horus summoned the demons and then we work out back to you know the herald again on this other planet and with, with the governor sort of you know quite quite scared well you know yeah basically shitting himself with like the, the thought of horus would just do what do this as he needed to um Honestly, it didn't come off like that. Like, um, facing Horace, you already know that you're going to 
you know, if you're going to stand against Horus, you're already going to know that you're going to face annihilation in one form or another. So I don't understand why this guy's tale of just how that one was done is enough to scare, obviously, the starch, the really sort of, you know, steadfast uh, imperial governor. It, it didn't, it came off as a little bit odd to me. It just, I just didn't, I just didn't feel it. Like the tactics themselves, the Horus um, shows weren't really all that new. We've seen take these, you know, these tactics before. We know how much of a, a war master and a stratagem that Horus is. We know he, he, he he's the man. Um, and he's talking to like this new hero, sort of like a child. He's like, look, look into the um, the holosphere. What do you see? How you know? Ask the question you want to and whatnot. And it's just like, and he's explaining his thoughts and the thoughts, uh, thoughts behind Exeter Beta as he's trying to contemplate Horace's thoughts. And it just comes off as a little. I know it's not arrogant because well, obviously he is arrogant. It just doesn't come off as some, as good as some of the previous times that we've seen Horace's um, intellect. Yeah, unfortunately, it's only a short story, so it's not that bad. It's just um yeah uh, it's, it's probably not, not one of my favorite ones in this entire collection but it's not bad to read especially and if you're a fan of just horace himself and then i guess you'll enjoy it so yeah that was uh, i think the 11th book dark compliance Twelve, Duty Waits. Duty Waits is probably one of the more books I did enjoy. Nothing substantial happens, but it's just a surreal look at just what's happening on Terra. Basically, it's just accounts of a few different Imperial fists as they're just doing their duty. It's exactly what the book says. Duty Waits. Um, it just gives them accounts over like uh, you know months of just what it is they're doing. Um, all the different sort of routines, checkpoints that they go through, just how tedious and, and long it is. Like one captain, you know, he's trying to get a company of, you know, a few thousand men through a checkpoint and, you know, he has to give, you know, renal scans, um, um, biological samples, um, you give a, a code that changes every day, as well as rank and have himself, you know, you know, looked at, scrutinized and you know if he shows any sign of like hesitation or suspicion he can be immediately shot on sight by his um fellow imperial fist already stationed there and there's like several hundred of these checkpoints that he has to get through in order to get him uh, and his, his company to where they're supposed to be stationed and every single person has to go through this like every day it shows you just how much of a tedious process that they that the dawn has gone to in, in order to secure the throne world um and we get another account of basically another imperial fist who's just on the line duty um, underground watching all the um uh basically all the menials who are tasked with watching like the long range augers it just goes past like day by day six six in section each asking each one is there any you know any any new um, threats or scans um and whatnot you know there's their reply no not yet and he's like you know, let me know as soon as it happened. He just does this routinely every single day. Um, you know, I don't know, he's been doing it for years, I guess, wait, as they all wait for the Trader Legion to turn up, and then, yeah. They only, and, and then only thing, real interesting thing that happens of note is basically saying um, all the food rations that give all this populace their food have sort of um, um, stopped coming and end up being a riot. I think this is one guy who's sort of pushing the crowd to obviously start dealing with it. Um... Oh, I think the, the, the guys, not the Imperial Guardsmen, um, but basically the the police who's in charge, uh, heavily outnumbered, so then the Imperial Fist turn up, but that only sort of makes things work, and the crowd sort of starts to turn on the Imperial Fist, throwing stones and cursing at them, um, and then the order is given to uh, and quash, quash the thing, and basically Imperial Fist just open up for a few seconds, mowing down thousands though, because obviously there are studies with bolt guns against unarmed civilians, so it doesn't go well for them. Um, and then, yeah, the, and then back to duty as they wait. So it just gives you, like, all the book is in itself is just a just a long look at basically what's happening on the throne world as the Imperial Fists wait for the inevitable, you know, battle that we all know is coming. It's, it's, I think it gives, it's a really nice just to real walk, uh, look, and that's why I, I actually kind of really enjoyed it. And that was book 12, Duty Waits. Book 
thirteen is the Magisterum. It's a it's a story about uh, the Custodes and Constantine Valdor. So with the we're way war over, and basically the Custodian Guard now devastated to the point where the ten thousand sons are now less than a thousand. Um, Constantine, Constantine Valdor finds himself as, um, as, with, as the word of the Emperor, as the Emperor is still sort of stuck on the throne trying to hold things together in the, in the, in the, in the warp. Um, and he just saw the re different recounts of of him dealing with basically Primarchs. It's, it's just sort of, it's a real, it's probably the first and only real look we get at uh, uh, Constantine Valdor's mindset and opinion. A lot of it is sort of done through the um, uh, the mind of you know his followers we don't actually get to look into Valdor's uh, mindset we just see the uh, views of his fellow custodians around him um, and yeah it's really it basically he, he, he you know he's talking he's telling Dawn you know, what his plans are but Dawn's like no this is now an Astartes war your, your job is to stand by the Emperor you have you, you have no part left in in um, you know the outside war and it's got and Constantine, Constantine Valdor sort of just as much as he doesn't want to, he just has to accept this as, um, as, as um, Dawn is the Lord Commander of the Imperium. Um, Malgodor is too busy dealing with stuff, and the Emperor is situated on the throne. Um, yeah. So Constantine Valdor sort of doesn't really have much of a say anymore. He tries to pull rank of Magisterum, but it doesn't really have a sway over Dawn. You know, stubborn Dawn, and and it just shows you his his recounts of. Um, <coughs> Different, there's different interactions, uh, especially with, um, you know, he, he's basically, Dawn has given him grief over the fact that they should have ignored the Emperor's command and pulled out of the way way sooner to save his numbers, and Count Valdor's saying, no, it was the Emperor's orders as part of his plan. We we do what he does because his, his vision is grander and far more seen than us. We don't know how much of a ripple effect we do here as part of his, his obviously, his plan. Um, and obviously the custodians are rigid in this thought, but Dawn is just like, no, you're you, you're infallible. You, you should have you should have called you, you know you should have called him out on it. You know the emperor. You see the emperor is this all knowing thing, but he's not. Constantly available also obviously just takes exception to this. I mean, and he's reminded of like another sort of um, time when he was dealing with um, Russ on Prospero, and it comes out when I'm like really really funny um probably one of my favorite moments uh that i can um, remember sort of rush just comes hurtling up on the back of a giant land raider or larger vehicle um to the surprise of constantine valdor i think he, he just assumed all pro Primar primarchs would be at the at the head running into battle some sort of glorious pose um and rush comes up and he's just like um you're late oh, he says he says something like um uh, you're a bit late after receiving the orders to um to, to, to fight Constantine Valdor's like he didn't say anything but he's just like nobody but the man, Emperor of Mankind gives us gives me orders um, he doesn't say that there's to Dawn uh, Rush he just sort of let Rush, Rush just continue and whatnot. and he's just like well you know you wanted to come down first and, and Rush's like haha yeah you're right and I don't know what they how the argument it's not really much of an argument it's just how Rush is you'll know how Rush is, is I think they're sort of sort of pushing for who's in charge um, and it comes to a head when like Russ is like, ah, I see what the problem is, you know, you, you, you little ones, you think you're so close, but you'll never be as close as, as we, the, the true sons are. We, we are the genetic link, we're the true sons, we'll, you, you know, the custodians will never be as close to the emperor as, 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 as me. And, and right, like, Dawn, uh, not Dawn, um, Constantine Valdor is literally silent for like a few seconds, just flabbergasted. With like this, this look on his face, and he's just, his next response is like, "There are so many areas there, I don't know where to begin," and and then basically uh, Rush just runs off into battle. And I just thought that was really funny because anyone who knows the Custodians knows how close they are to the Emperor. They are probably more truer sons than the Primarchs themselves because the like both the Custodians and the Primarchs and the Emperor are just tools. Um, they're just different types of tools, really. So yeah, and then we cut back to Valdor's um, with with Dawn and uh, he's basically like but I think Constantine Valdor sort of finally snaps and he's like the only time I've ever questioned the Emperor's um, plan or um, what he was doing is when he decided to create you guys 
the Primax because this is this is all the Primax fault and and like he basically like Valdo just goes off and he's like you Primax are the ones that did this you know you're the ones that have gone against the Empress plans this is all your fault and this is the only time I've ever questioned when he's decided to do something I should have if I was going to bring something up then I should have brought it up when he first originally designed you and Dawn is just like silent and like everyone thinks that like the tension is about to break but Dawn's just like breathes out and it's like well nothing's going to change now so let's just move on you you stay, stay and guard the emperor i'll deal with the fight and veld also just has to accept that and and yeah and then yeah, that that's pretty much the book in itself it's but i thought it was just really nice like to get the like we finally get funny constantine Valdor's view and opinion on stuff and he's like this very stoic hard set man but he's not it shows you that the the, the um uh the custodians aren't just rigid you know rocks they have thoughts and opinions and whatnot especially when it comes to like the pro marks apparently so yeah that was book 13 the magistorum book 14 now pearls midnight Sort of an odd name but um basically this story is, is recalls um uh Ruggles dawn's thoughts before the inevitable call out that the traders have finally arrived um you know there's been some uh, he's been told by his astropaths that there's some warp, warp turbulence that, that the inevitable is coming um i think the long range augurs have finally finally sort of picked up things and he's sort of gone um he, he goes down he tells everyone to take, you know, to leave, you know, let the Imperial Fist deal with the next, like, four hours to not, whatnot. It sort of just accounts his time up till midnight when he finally gives, um, like, the or, or, um, out the orders to all the all stations and all the posts that, you know, the time has come. Prepare yourself for, for the fight. Um, yeah, it is not, doesn't do too much. It's just a, sort of a nice account beforehand as he's walking around the palace one last time, walking the walls, making sure that, you know, he's done everything he could before obviously the inevitable battle um yeah i think he finally and then like right at the end as the order finally goes out he's standing alongside his brothers khan and sanguinius and who's the other primarch that was there's four primarchs on terra dawn khan sanguinius and i apologize i just can't remember at the moment i don't think it's correct he's out and about russ is also out and about um Oh, is it Vulcan? It must be Vulcan. Yeah, it is Vulcan because what? Where the hell is he? I don't remember him in the, in that. Oh, okay, he must be doing something else. Because I remember, yeah, Vulcan's on is on Terra. He managed to get there back on Terra without telling like his legion, the Salamanders, which is kind of a dick move. We'll get into that when I finally get around to doing his book, Vulcan Lives, and all the after books, you know, things like that. But yeah, so yeah, so basically, Dawn and, and and you know the order goes out, and everyone's told to read the orders at midnight, and then shows shows you. You know it's midnight and they will read the orders and um and dawn's voice commanding that uh prepare for battle the traitors have arrived and yeah nothing too important story-wise but it's that it's, it's, it's that important like note in the heresy that we've all been waiting for you know we were finally up to like this is like books i think between 15 and 60 and it's that sort of pinnacle note when they're finally in the sector i, I don't actually think they're physically there i think it's just like the warp signatures are finally being picked up um and so the, the message is going out because i don't I, I got the feeling that they weren't actually physically in the soul system yet there was just it was sort of like the warp uh, readings that they were all astro pass were uh, picking up um they may i might, might be wrong about that may they may actually have physically finally appeared in the soul system or dealing with um beta gamma one of the the that big fight there's, there's a place that they have to get through first um but basically this is that this is that moment where I, I, I guess in heresy you would say that the, the traders have finally arrived and the, the battle for terror finally begins. So yeah, that's why it's a nice little story because it's, it's what we're finally been waiting for after all this time. Uh, but it's called the Now Pearl's Midnight. I don't really get the name of the reference. But yeah, that was book 13. Dreams of Unity. 
Um, this one's an odd little book in the whole collection. It doesn't really serve a purpose as a whole. It doesn't really expand any sort of the, the story that we know. But it gives us a, a look into the Thunder Legion and some surviving Thunder Legion warriors from obviously back, back way back when. Um, basically, I think there's a few... Three three guys who um, have managed to survive the calling um, from the custodians when the emperor gave the order to basically end them, and they're basically being <coughs> uh, surviving as best as possible. I think fighting in the gladiator matches under some sort of um, handler at the time. Um, we follow one. Uh, I forgot what the name is because it doesn't really make, make much sense. We follow one guy as he's watching his friend finally be beaten and about to be killed, and he jumps into the ring and and um, kills his friend's uh, attacker and then offers his friend you know, on, on a death because he's, he's willing to survive anyway. Um, this causes a bit of problems, obviously, it's against the rules and whatnot, and his handler sends him out into, um, into like, uh, you know, the, uh, the slums or whatnot to find the, his, third, his third friend who has been missing for some amount of time. And whatnot, and yeah, and and and, and enter in between them. Um, Valdor gives one of his Scotties the job to go and check out some suspicious activity. They, they think there might be some cultist work happening in the Hegemon slums or the Hegemon. Um, so this custodian is, is sent out there to go and deal with it, and then what? Yeah, and we come back to um, <clears throat> our, our Thunder Warrior friend. He, he's found his he's found he's found his friend, and basically. Um, uh, pit of um, slaughtered bodies. Um, I think he seems to assume that he went into um, a dream-like state. All the Thunder Warriors, um, Legion is, um, are, are falling back into um, dreams of unity, basically, where they just dream about the past, past wars alongside the Empress side, and sort of obviously, yeah, there's not a good, not good thing, especially in the middle of the bar, and you think you're fighting, you know, hordes of, of you know, savages and whatnot, and so. Um, I think his friend attacks him because he's still in the dreams and he has to, he has to kill him in, in his own defense and what yeah so he takes him back to where he, his place is going only to find out that it's on fire and somewhat destroyed um, he believes it's because of you know the trouble that he caused at the gladiator matches and and yeah and he goes and try you know to find out there's another friend uh, his last friend basically only to find him basically I think dead and whatnot um, what it comes down to is just basically he he himself keeps falling into his own visions and his dreams of the of unity where he, you know he can't really do much. Um, the custodies that we follow, um, he he that we know of, he's going into the catacombs, following this thing to find you know basically um, some cultists and a demon alpha legion, a demon legionnaire who's you know so the rumors are true, and he's, he engages them in a fight, and basically then we just it's the we go back to Thunder Legion warrior who you know. Uh, you know, following the, the path of carnage to find out that you know it wasn't his friend, it wasn't his, like his last friend that did all this. It was sort of some of this evil presence, which he basically tracks down to find. Also, the um, the the demon legionnaire and the custodians fighting it, and the demon legionnaire sort of gets the upper hand on the custodians, but our thunder legion warrior gets gets in in there to um, fight, takes some bad damage, but gives the custodians enough time to basically kill the demon le legionnaire. Um, and he offers him his support, and he's like, "Are you a, are you a Thunder Warrior Legion?" And he's like, "Yeah." He's like, "I didn't think any of you guys survived." And he's like, "Yeah, no." He's like, "Do you need support?" And um, yeah, and, and basically the Thunder Warrior understands that they shouldn't have lived this long. He understands now why they should have died, and he asks for the honor death from the custodian, which obviously the custodian um, gives immediately because that's how stoic they are. And yeah, that's basically the whole story in a nutshell. Um, <clears throat> as, as you say, as I said, it doesn't really give much to the Horus Heresy or any sort of. It gives, just gives you a look at maybe a little bit of Custodes' work, much more about the Thunder Warriors, um, and the fact that obviously there's a little cultist band and a Demon Legion in, on Terra, and and yeah, like it's it's nice, but it, like I didn't really care much for the Thunder Legion, and and it shows you just how sort of degenerate they are. Like this, they in order to survive this long, they require obviously the organs of their, their fellows because they're the only ones they can keep them sustained so when obviously one one warrior goes down they harvest the organs and and implant them into the remaining warriors that were, were they failing and whatnot with the cancers and and things and obviously the mindset where they keep because they were when they were, were built to survive this long and that's why the emperor ordered their purge and yeah 
And yeah, it doesn't really add much, but it was nice, I guess, and sad in, in its end. And that's the, like the 13th, um, no, not the 13th, that was the 15th book, Dreams of Unity. book is book 16 the board is set and basically what this is is just a short story about what Malcolm uh, Malcolm sort of like final th final thoughts on basically how the last parts of the free time will play out before the actual the battling begins um, he goes to go see the Emperor who's basically still on the throne trying to keep the darkness um, beneath the palace at bay he's sort of like lost um, I don't want to say lost hope but he's sort of like hasn't been responding to anyone because he no longer has any idea of how things are going to play out or what to do because obviously his grand plan has sort of just gone askew so yeah, even the custodians are a little bit little upset at like sort of his demeanor um but yeah so Mark Mark Little goes down and um <coughs> sort of I think they're in this sort of mind scape world or preconceived it's like not the physical realm but it's hard to say that it's not the mental realm either. Like, it's hard to, yeah. They, they, they discuss and they start playing their, their board game. Um, I don't think, not Regicide. I don't even know what kind of game it is. Like, it's sort of like chess, but with cards. They're sort of playing it out, and it's like a weird card game. Um, but yeah, like, uh, the, um, um, <coughs> the Emperor sort of, you know, musing over the different cards and their pieces, and. They may, may, may indeed or may not stand for, obviously, players and the actual heresy themselves. Like, the card game is supposed to be a metaphor of the the, the grandest things that's happening in the heresy. Like, um, I think they've never, they've never played a game beyond anything they don't know um, until now. It's the first time that um, the Emperor plays out the game with Malkador to see the final, final results. Um, you know, with each card sort of musing on its own sort of thing. Like, you know, we have... The, we have the Hydra, uh, um, only to find out that there's a, there's a second Hydra um, that Malkador didn't know about. You know, things like that, because obviously we know that there's there's two Primarchs in the Alpha Legion and and whatnot. Um, uh, Hor and Malkador represents Horus um, in the, in, as the War Master trying to break the Emperor's forces <coughs> and how he would get about trying to do that. Um, it doesn't really show you all too much. The only sort of um, major things are is that the Emperor wants to push Malkador to go to the extreme, and to do so, he has to make him angry. Um, and basically says all this, this really mean shit to Malkador, saying, you, you know, you're nothing. You're This is the card that represents you. And it shows him, like, this is, like, card, but it's basically a false image, and it just reveals the fool. It's like, you're just basically my stand-in tool. You're nothing more than an instrument. I would throw you away with, like... Um, like you know without any disregard and but they like Malkador understands what the Emperor's trying to do but the Emperor is just like ruthless and relentless and doesn't doesn't let up to the point where Malkador finally snaps he starts crying not like not like you know like tears starts streaming down his cheeks that he can't really control and you know he understands so basically Malkador finally sort of relents and he just basically goes full throttle on the Emperor um and pushes pushes his, his fight to him and in doing so like he sacrifices his angel in order to um, take, I think not the win, but to push his war master into regard, and that's when the sort of the, <coughs> the game ends, or sort of everything sort of snapbacks to reality, um, and the Malgador sort of left with, left with I, I don't really know, like a revelation or his own thoughts about how the whole process worked. Um, obviously, the the sacrifice sacrificing the angel card was obviously a representation of Sanguinius because we all know what happens there um this but does this implicate does this or does this not implicate the fact that the emperor knew beforehand that the emperor um Sanguinis would have died um we don't know i mean i kind of feel that's the emperor so i kind of feel like yeah like um and he's not above sacrificing something for the the end game which is kind of a dick move but if he asked Sanguinius, Sanguinius would throw down his life for the emperor in any means necessary because um, that's just how Sanguinius is, and yeah, 
Um, Malcolm was given sort of a little bit of reprieve, understanding that the, the car that he was was actually the you know it, was, it wasn't the full it, uh, you know sort of it, it sort of goes back to being nice, but like it's just it's just like a card game version of how the heresy has been playing out, so that both the emperor and Sigilite can sort of play the pieces and and find out trying to find the end game and how the hell you know it's going to all end up, which we all know doesn't really go well. Malcolm ends up sacrificing himself on the. Um, on the, the throne and the emperor ends up crippled and uh, throne bound for the next 10,000 years <clears throat> so yeah um, that's basically the board is set it doesn't really do too much other than just a nice little look at Malkador and the emperor and also how the emperor is coping with the fact that he lost the Weird Way War and sort of you know nothing is is set up you know he's got no grand plans anymore it's all sort of come unraveled and he doesn't really I feel like it's the first time he sort of doesn't know what to do um, and as, as the book suggests the board is set these are basically all the pieces are now in place and the only thing left to do is play out the game and that's sort of what this book represents, represents. and that's the last book book 16 the board is set so that was my sort of comprehensive look at all the different uh, short short stories in the Heralds of the Siege, and my sort of um, a final opinion on the actual novel itself is I I enjoyed it more than um, I did the previous one, the previous book I um I read, which was about you know the the Primarchs trying to um, slaves to darkness, trying to you know get stuff to get to get together. Um, like it was the slaves to darkness was a good book, but if you um, see it you understand my review last time the only difference is that my review last time was like one of my first ever videos so the quality isn't as good and hopefully this one will stand up a lot better the next book is titan death which is um yeah the fight at beta garmin basically with the thing is finally fight it out and, and guess and i'm looking forward to that i'm a big fan of titans and whatnot but yeah back to heralds of the siege i do enjoy short story books and this one does give you a nice little look it sort of shows you the whole pinnacle um, you know, leading up to everything. Um, like, there, there may be a few things that have been missed, and there may be a few s stories in there that I just didn't really see much of a point to. to. Like, it just seemed like filler. Um, but it's nice that we get the comprehensive, you know, like, the defining moment as it all begins, you know. It sort of reminds me of that um, uh, Lord of the Rings, the two towers, you know, the, the, they're all in, like, helmless deep, and, you know, as the uruk march up, and they're all just sitting there waiting as the rain comes in, and it sort of, it gives you that somnus feel, and that's that's what this book representates, is, is, is you know, is them on their wall waiting as, 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 you know, the trade legions march up. And I think it's a definitely a good book to read, and I would definitely recommend it, um, you know, you would go out there and you'd read this book. So thanks guys for listening to me drag on about Heralds of the Siege and I hope you appreciate the work and I love you guys out there so much. Please um, like and leave a comment and let me know what you guys think and I'll get back to trying to do the other books um, as fast as possible as I can. Cheers guys.